All right, Bim Bang, today's Tuesday, it's September 20th. Welcome to the Dog Walk presented by Barstool Sports. It's Eddie, it's Chief. It is uh, Tinfoil Tuesday. So, Tinfoil slash what they do slash cult slash Ooh. science slash everything. It's all centered around one guy. I think I was fascinated by this story. I had never heard of it. So, this was another uh, listener, viewer recommendation i want to pull the guy's name up because this is so helpful like we've been doing this show every week for three years it's like you kind of run out of stories that you know so if, if you guys send in stuff and it's awesome like this one i really appreciate it so you I'll, seem like you thoroughly enjoyed this story i i need like an hbo series about the, like a fictionalized series about this guy because it's utterly preposterous Jeez. yeah wow well and a lot of different tie-ins to different things that we've talked about uh previously wow well i'm interested to hear about mm -hmm. it before we talk about it though i do want to talk about uh the exclusive ticketing partner of barstool sports game time that is game time it is created by fans for fans the game time to app is a new ticketing app that makes it easier than ever to score last minute deals on tickets to sports concerts and shows and they guarantee the lowest price if you haven't given game time a shot yet i don't know what you're waiting for you guys are going to love this app I, I really seriously like we've been talking about it for a while. I think Carl's going up to went up to Lambo using it. We use it for week one. I, I think now go with, to the fucking Texans game. Go to the Texans game yeah, week three. Texans. You know I I'm probably going to be able to find some cheap Notre Dame ch tickets later in the year. I'm going to use game time for that. So it's always game time. Game time is the uh, the absolute best. Yep, we've had tons of Barcel fans using it, uh, hitting us up on socials. And uh, tell us the great deals they're getting. So mm -hmm. easy to use, amazing deals. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the U.S. You're going to love it. So download the Game Time app, go to the account tab to create a login, redeem code DOGWALK for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Download Game Time, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Chief. This guy's name is uh, Jack Parsons. He was born Marvel Parsons, which was he would have been Marvel Marvel Parsons Jr. Marvel Whiteside Parsons Jr. if we're going to be totally accurate, which is a powerful, powerful name. Uh, but he hit, his parents split up pretty. Kind of sounds like he might be doomed from the start with that name. Yeah. So when his parents split up, and he was very young when they split up, uh, and they were both from like wealthy Massachusetts families who had relocated to California uh, in the early 1900s, so in, in, into Los Angeles area. And so his mother changed it to Jack, but he was born Marvel Parsons. And it's like, fuck, like that's a, that's a, that's a great name. But with that divorce, it had uh, an impact on him. Uh, so this, he was a kid who was always just kind of like a little socially weird, like wouldn't really uh, go outside and play. He was just one of those kids who just loved to read and he loved specifically science fiction novels and that science fiction inspired him to pursue this career um, in rocketry and aeronautics. And he was so like dedicated from like the earliest of ages to build a rocket and send man into space. Cause he was so influenced by these, uh, he loved the science, but he also just loved like the science fiction, like the idea of man leaving earth because it had never been done. And he was like, so, so into it that in middle school, he himself described uh, something he did where he tried to summon the devil through like different spells and seances and shit and was gonna sell his soul to the devil in exchange for building a rocket that could take him to outer space. So at like a, a very young age, he was like, uh, this is my destiny, I'm gonna do it, I will do anything to it, including selling my soul to Satan. So it didn't work, and he called it a, quote, magical fiasco when he couldn't, like, ah, well, couldn't get the devil in here. I was, you know, big mistake on my part. Won't do that again. And But he was never, even though he was, like, super smart, and um, he was just never a good student. And it was, like, he had a singular focus, which was coming up with rockets. So he was like, hey, like, read this Huck Finn book. He'd be like, no, nah, I'm building rockets. So he was there, his parent, his mom had a house. It was paid for by his grandfather in Southern California and their whole backyard 
was just fucking craters everywhere because this kid was just like trying to build rocket fuel and jet fuel and would like set off fireworks and he was always just trying to like understand like propulsion and rocketry and he was just blowing shit up in the backyard just like just picture the like, real life Sid from Toy Story yeah, basically and he would uh so just imagine like hey you know hey hey jack it's time to come in for dinner you'd be like oh one second there's just like this explosion in the backyard with like six foot craters like mm -hmm. oh there goes jack again so the, the mother this kid had no grades like awful grades and no like real he had one friend and he would kind of stay with that friend like kind of forever through all his endeavors and they had similar interests science fiction rocket so they're just out in the backyard blowing shit up and eventually the mom's like i don't know what to do she she calls the grandfather and they send him to a military boarding school. And it's like, this is what, you know, we'll get this kid on the straight and narrow. We'll get him figured out. And he goes in there and promptly blows up a toilet in the dorm. So it's like, well, you're expelled and back to regular high school for you because you blew up the fucking toilet because he's just addicted to blowing shit up and rockets and things like that. So, you know, long story short, he eventually kind of, you know, gets into this junior college and he's in like the engineering and the in uh, chemistry um, and he tries to transfer to Stanford but now he's getting to an age where um, or a, a time frame rather he was born in 1914 so now we're getting in it's in the depression so his grandfather that was funding their entire lifestyle he and the mother passes away and with his passing they lost all the access to the money so and it was the depression so he had no tuition money to pay for stanford or anything else so now he's like 19 years old or something like that can't get it can't afford stanford um so he stays going to this junior college but he starts going to all of these different seminars where it's all the leaders you know they do these speaking like kind of like sounds like it was like ted talks and they would have these speaking seminars that were largely at caltech and he got, he was just always going, always going. And eventually he got a relationship with this guy who gave him access to uh, this place called the Guggenheim Aeronautical Lab, okay? Which had all this, this state of the art equipment and you know all the chemicals you need and this and that. And he and his like middle school friend were kind of doing this together. And they got access to that lab because the guy was like, oh, my God, like, you're so like, you're bright, but you're annoying. Um, yeah, sure. Just go, go figure, do your own thing in the lab because the lab had been abandoned because there was no funding for it for the depression. So it had this great equipment, but they weren't using it because it was like, you just can't. Like, it was just like they didn't have the people to teach. They didn't like anybody who was in that field went on to work on something else because there was just no funding for this at like a large scale level, but it was enough you know, equipment in there for him. So then he was able to recruit kind of like uh, other like-minded best and brightest from Caltech. And they started like working on this project uh, to create a rocket engine and, and rocket fuel that could send somebody into space. And so they eventually get out of control there a little bit, whereas like the explosions were, were too big even for this lab. So they moved into like this weird like valley gorge thing in pasadena which was safer and all that they got the nickname their group they had like he assembled a team because like hey like we're doing these cool experiments in this lab like why don't you come with us so he has this team together and they start doing these experiments in this in this gorge in pasadena and they get the nickname the suicide squad from the other students which is kind of a badass nickname suicide squad and it was because they were like constantly blowing shit up and like, Oh, that guy, what happened to you? You got a big, you know, big knock on your head while well, a rock or a pipe or something came exploded, got me in the face. What happened to your eyebrows? Well, singed off. Like, what are you going to do? So they're always just like working on these different experiments, blowing shit up, kind of the same thing that he was doing in his mother's backyard. Now he was doing in a grander, more sophisticated way in Pasadena, but, uh, was still blowing shit up. Eventually they figured it out. They figured out like how to make rocket fuel and a rocket engine and they called it, it was an, it's an acronym called JADO. It's the JADO rocket. And now he's like into his twenties and the air force catches wind of this and they're like, Hey, like you cracked the code. Like you guys, like you 
Suicide Squad guys. You figured it out. So the Air Force hired him. They bought the uh, rights to that uh, rocket fuel that they made and set them up in um, uh, the Jet Propulsion Lab, which is in Pasadena to this day. JPL, and if you've seen the movie Mars, uh, if you've seen, like they reference it in Mad Men, any kind of thing from that era or anything that kind of talks about NASA in a big way, we'll talk about JPL because the space shuttle, all the Apollo projects, all everything, the technology and the experiments to basically have the United States space program was built out of JPL, which was built by this guy, essentially Jack Parsons. So he is, you want to talk about like the moon landing, um, space shuttle, all these different things. It started with this guy who is a professional blow shit up guy from the time that he was 11. He founded, essentially founded NASA. Dude, I, that's interesting because how do they determine, right? Someone who's just outside doing shit like this from being like, oh, that kid's like onto something yeah. versus like, oh, that guy's going to be a future criminal. You know? Or both. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe. yeah. Well, and there is science behind it because it's not just like, I mean, anybody can take a stick of dynamite, maybe not like design it from scratch, but can blow things up. Oh, let's light this gasoline on fire. But he was doing like the, to create rocket fuel and their rocket fuel. It was like a very trial and error technical thing where they were getting more and more force um, out of like the, the chemistry and the engineering of the actual rocket. So they were like shooting these things, almost like, uh, have you ever seen October Sky? I have, and I'm familiar with the premise. Okay, though. so it's Jake Gyllenhaal. I think it's like his first movie. Very good movie. Yeah, but I think you've told me like, you're very passionate about yeah, this movie. It's a very good movie. Yeah. It's a very good maybe movie. Maybe not, but maybe I It's know. like, uh, how old are you? Uh, you have a nephew or nieces? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Are they, like when they get to be like 10, it's a great movie for them. Yeah. It's a very good movie, yeah. And it's that that's like these West Virginia kids years later this is like in the uh, 50s where they kind of do go through the same thing where they like figure out the fuel they figure out how to build a rocket and they just get better and better and better at it until the point that i think that kid got a job working for nasa oh, really? as well and um, but you know what i mean like how yeah. they say uh like the first signs of like a serial killer is like they're killing animals yeah like, what if some kid was just really it's interested like, in, like, the anatomy? And yeah. he went on to be, like, the greatest veterinarian or the greatest, you know, by, like... I think you, what you do is you watch them carefully, okay? <laughs> it's like, is yeah. this, yeah. you know, did you find that animal pre-dead? Yeah, Like, yeah, is it yeah. a roadkill that you're trying to figure out the anatomy of it? Or yes. did you just, like, trap and, like, murder for your own pleasure and education? It's a little bit different. Hey, actually, Chief, before we get to that, now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. It can be tough to train your brain to stay in problem-solving mode when faced with a challenge in life. But when you learn how to find your own solutions, there's no better feeling. A therapist can help you, with, a therapist can help you become a better problem-solver, making it easier than ever to accomplish your goals. Let me redo that line, Harry. Yeah, a therapist can help you become a better problem-solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. Definitely try out therapy if you find yourself yep. in a situation where you need someone to talk to. Everybody um, needs somebody to talk to. A thousand percent. Yep. Uh, so if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists anytime. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash walk today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash walk. One more time, BetterHelp.com slash walk. All right, let's continue. Can't hurt. And But this, like, he had, like, proprietary um, formulas and, and sequencing that allowed him to make this rocket fuel uh, that the that the government was like yes, and he became like pretty wealthy. Like he bought a mansion in Pasadena based upon this technology and the and the growth of uh, the growth of JPL. And so he's going through that. He gets married at twenty one, and he's going through um, all this shit. But going back to when he tried to summon the devil, for a guy who was so into science, logic, engineering, chemistry, like the hard sciences. He never could really get rid of the like, dark side. The dark side, and like um, I don't even know what you would cut. There's like a word for it. Well, it's like the occult. Yeah. Okay. And so he he meets this guy, this English guy named Alistair Crowley, 
and Aleister Crowley was a magician and had a genius level IQ. And he like went to Cambridge, um, but eventually like rejected that and like really leaned into some of his like kind of dark arts type things. Like called himself the beast, but he was like a genius level, like a legitimate genius. And he meets uh, our guy, Jack Parsons, and kind of introduces him to this cult life. And they practiced this, this, their, the name of their cult was called Thelema, T-H-E-L-E-M-A. And it's, they had like a, a Latin phrase that means do what thou wilt. And it's when you read about what they believe, it's very similar to like the secret, like the secret went like big. I feel like maybe 15, 20 years ago where it's like, you know, you speak out your desires, you make like your vision boards and you just say what you want. And if you really practice and focus on those things, the universe will deliver them to you. Okay. It's like positive affirmations, things like that. And the little slight difference with uh, Thelema. I feel like this is not going to be slight. Versus uh, the secret. <laughs> Thelema versus the secret is that this was a sex cult. Oh. Okay. So they believed that the only time that it was effective to like have these like affirmations and these thoughts were right when you're about to come. So right as you're orgasming, you have to be like, I want a rocket to take me out of space right as you're coming. So they're having that because they're like it opens up like this gate to the universe where you're like hyper pleasure. Your brain is flooded with these chemicals and you're like half there, half not. So like if you're in that state, in that moment, that's when you say and you like basically they, they, they the research I did said they would like some of it was just like affirmations. Other ones said that they were like saying spells like cast like witch shit like casting spells while they're coming, which is fucking freaky and weird. Um, but that was, Damn. that was like their, you know, the secret talks about the law of attraction and they were doing like the law of attraction, but they were only like, they would be making like their vision boards while they're coming. Okay. So this guy, Jack Parsons, who's like this top scientist, maybe in all of America at this time running JPL, you know, you could just picture him with like the glasses and the skinny tie, the white shirt with no sleeves, like one of those traditional like NASA looking guys, all buttoned up, crew neck, kind of like straight and narrow haircut, clocks out for the day, goes home and, and would host like these occult sex party orgy parties at his at his at his own house. And they would have all sorts of different people coming through. And his wife was like never really on board with the whole thing. Uh, but she left him after he was having one of these sex cult ritual things with her sister. So that was kind of, that's where you want to have sex parties. I guess. All right. You fuck my sister while you're trying to get to outer space on a rocket. That's, that was it. It's a bit too far. That was a bit too far for her. Okay. So just kind of crazy. I mean, <laughs> It, that this was like the foundation, okay? So now they're running around like he, he has, he's leading like this double life. So he's meeting all these different sorts of people. And one guy that he becomes um, enamored with and friends with is L. Ron Hubbard. So L. Ron Hubbard, who if that name is ringing a bell, he's the founder of Scientology. Going clear. Going clear, Tom Cruise, Will Smith, like the, you know, the number one uh, religion in Hollywood, it seems like. And, uh, and that was L. Ron Hubbard. But before L. Ron Hubbard was like known for Scientology, he was, uh, a f I don't know about very successful, but he was a, uh, a published, uh, science fiction writer. So Jack Parsons, who had been, uh, you know, never really gave up his love for science fiction writing, knew who he was and started inviting him to all these different, you know, to his sex cult, uh, orgy parties. And so L. Ron Hubbard was fucking into it and he was into some of the, the teachings of like this law of attraction. And if you look at the writings and some journals and things like that by the guy Aleister Crowley, there's a lot of parallels between what Aleister Crowley and Jack Parsons would say and preach in, in this Thelema thing and what 
L. Ron Hubbard eventually put into like the practices of Scientology. So they're saying like L. Ron Hub Hubbard was deeply influenced by Jack Parsons and, and Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley um, was also very into drugs and he eventually got hooked on heroin and that was kind of like the end for him. So he like never really recovered from that where Jack Parsons didn't really participate in, at least not in those hard drugs, um, but was into it very much into the occult and like the dark arts and things like that. In addition to the science, cause he was like attacking this problem from all angles. And he eventually, that's interesting. Cause I didn't, you gotta, to my in, knowledge, uh, Scientology is not super rooted in sex, is it? I don't know about that part, but yeah. science, but they, but theirs was more about. So it's like if you remove the sex part, the Thelema thing is like be the best version of yourself, uh, like the secret stuff, like mm -hmm. make these affirmations, say what you want, be you know, become the best version of yourself, and everything will fall into place for you, and um, and so that's the part that Scientology kind of took, like some like self help type stuff baked it into some of their core core beliefs. And so now we got uh, Jack Parsons, we're into the 40s, and he's working on JPL, and he's also simultaneously running this, you know, he's like the, the big dog at this, uh, at the sex cult thing because with Thelema, because it's usually the parties, or a lot of the parties rather are at his house. And so he convinces a group of people to start uh, the Babylon working project and this Babylon was this sex. It's a city in ancient Samaria, I believe. Um, but people have heard of like the Babylon hanging gardens. And so it's all like this, like ancient ritual stuff supposedly. And she was like the sex goddess. You can think of her as kind of like mother earth. And she is like, in, like it's like a real thing. You can, she's a symbol of a, a sexually liberated woman. Okay. And so they start having these sexual <laughs> rituals and they think that their core belief and what they're trying to achieve is the birth of a quote unquote moon child, which is a moon child is a kid who is raised to aspire to travel to space. Like they wanted to bring about moon children through this thing. And, um, and it's like, I don't know, man, maybe it fucking worked. Okay. Because, and the other part of this obviously was he was very into sex. Okay. Like sex addict, Alistair Crowley, also sex addict. And so they would say like, man, like this, our society tells us our, you know, religions tell us that we have to be monogamous. That's fucking bullshit. Let's do our own thing. We'll bring about moon children. We'll have free love. Okay. They want to have like open sex and they want to practice some of this shit and they want to send people to the moon. Well, what happened in the 60s? We got to the moon and like you had the hippie free love revolution that was going on. So it's like, did they have so much sex and say when, when they're coming, say these things to the point that like it brought about like a cultural revolution where we, we both ended up in space and everybody's just fucking all the time. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Something, something to think about. Yeah. If that's what their two main things were, then they did it within 20 years of really practicing this kind of maybe something to it. I don't know. So eventually time goes on. We're into like, I want to say it's like maybe 1949 now. Um, he, JPL, like the people in charge of JPL, they find out, okay, about the sex cult. And there's like different things where it's like, how did they find out? Well, there's, it's essentially JPL is funded by the government. So like they're watching you. And they found like, so it's like, dude, like you're out, like you're fucking fired. Okay. And so now he's like, fuck, like I'm out of this. My baby calls up his old buddy, L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard had left California. He started a boat company down in Florida. So he's like, Hey, yeah, why don't you come down? Like, we'll be partners on this thing. Uh, you know, just give me a $20,000 investment and we'll be good to go. And $20,000 back then is, you know, a good chunk of money. And so he gives it to him and moves down there with his, uh, then girlfriend who I believe was his ex-wife's sister, L Ron Hubbard. You know, they have like a similar sex cult group down there. L Ron Hubbard takes the $20,000 
never repays him. The boat company is actually fairly successful. So they had to, he had to like take him to court to get his money back. They never had any like documents about their like business partnership or anything like that, but he could prove that he gave him the $20,000. $20, so, and he also stole his girlfriend. He actually came down with multiple girlfriends. L. Ron Hubbard stole all of them. Okay. So, Damn. so, and like, so that Makes was sense, like, though. yeah. And that, I mean, that was, how... that was his friend. Okay. Who was like, yeah, actually, no, I'm just going to steal every, everything that you care about, like your girlfriends and your, and your last 20,000. It's mine now. And then, so they have like this big falling out. He goes back and he gets a job with Howard Hughes. So that was another episode we did last night. Howard Hughes was, you know, a CIA operative, uh, but it's Howard Hughes. If you've seen that movie, what is that movie aviator. with the aviator with Leo? Uh, he was like the like one of the leading, if not the leading, uh, aeronautic companies, uh, building all sorts of different planes, and you know, kind of revolutionizing jet tra jet travel, I should say. And uh, so he got a job with them, and this is the early fifties, like this is literally like 1950 now, and. That's like McCarthyism. Do you know what McCarthyism is? You, you ever study that in school? Not quite. So we, we covered it like, I don't know a ton about it, but it was like this guy who was a senator. His name is McCarthy. And basically he would, this is like the start of the Cold War. And he was basically accusing everybody of being a communist or a communist sympathizer and did all sorts of like illegal things and shitty things to root them out of government, root them out of like the business world and really had his sights set on uh, on Hollywood in particular. A lot of people would, and they would just get blacklisted. So Jack Parsons, he is working for Howard Hughes. He goes home and he had taken a bunch of documents, which not allowed to do. Even Trump is finding that out. You can't just take documents, you know, that are classified willy nilly. And so the FBI shows up at his door and they're like, why are you taking these documents? Because they're scared that he's, like he founded like the US space program. He knows everything about it. He knows the failures. He knows, you know, the the stuff that is working, the classified technology, the plans, the you know, it's all this is like the start of the space race and you know, satellites and all that shit. So they they think he might be spying for the Soviet Union because supposedly he was like a communist sympathizer and like went to meetings in like nineteen thirty nine before World War II. And so he's like, no, no, I'm not working with them. Uh, but I am applying for a job in Israel. And uh, that's why I took the documents because I want to be able to have this knowledge of this stuff before I go in for my interview with, with Israel. So then they're like, okay, so what, you're an Israeli spy? And he's like, no. But he's like, but you're taking our secret documents and you're going to go use them in Israel? He's like, well, yeah. They're like, that's not allowed. Like, you can't <laughs> fucking just steal documents and then, like, give them, like, to somebody else. He goes, oh, really? You know, like, so he doesn't get the job in Israel, obviously, but then he also gets blacklisted uh, in the United States. So he's never able to work in aeronautics ever again. So this guy, so this is, like, 1951 now. This all kind of came unraveling for him pretty quickly. So he's, he's out of aeronautics. He's out of money. He got no women because uh, he had he had remarried, but um, when his life fell apart, like she left him, she was a lunatic too. Like would say like she would have like these visions of the end of the world, and she was very into like the moon god it moon god shit um, that he was doing before the 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 Babylon working project. She was a Hollywood actress, gorgeous, classically beautiful woman, uh, but she left him to the point that and like he just could not get like work because he spent his whole life in aeronautics. It's all he really knew. So he had a house, not the mansion that he had in Pasadena before, but he had a house and he would rent out rooms in his house and he was working as a, as a gas station attendant. And then he would work as like an explosive consultant for different Hollywood movie studios. So he was working on all these different things. He gets a, he gets a call saying, Hey, like we need your help on something. We need you to be down here right now. Uh, like just grab the stuff from your lab and meet us at studio, whatever. So he grabs all the stuff and blows himself up. All his chemicals blow up. He has all this like, you know, facial damage, but he's not, he doesn't die. Like immediately they rush from the hospital and he dies like a few days later. And so at 37 years old, he only lived to be 37. 
And then it was like, well, that's rather suspicious because it's this guy who had all this um, knowledge, whatnot, background, right? secrets, documents. Like there's there's like conspiracies around. Well, did the government actually want him dead? And there's plenty of reasons to think that they did. And, you know, he wasn't like a, a middle schooler or even that early college kid anymore. He was a certified expert in all these different um, chemicals and their reactions to each other that they're like the idea that this guy would be so careless to blow himself up when he is like the foremost expert in the world is just like far fetched. So then people are like, did he, did he, was it suicide because his life was so bad? Uh, was it an accident? Like, you know, what, what, which, what, that was what was reported or did like somebody tamper with some of these chemicals and mislabel them intentionally trying to get him to mix them. And, and then like, like some like the FBI or somebody basically came in and tried to make it look like an accident and, and blew, you know, changed things around enough, tampered with his shit. So it would blow up. Cause like the call came in kind of unexpectedly. He was rushing, boom, blown up. Didn't die right away, mysteriously, not mysteriously, like succumbed to his wounds. But like, who knows, like somebody got into the hospital and killed him too. And, but so there's like all these mysteries around his death that are unsolved. And like, no one really, like, I think it's officially ruled an accident. But then there's a camp that say it was, had to have been suicide because he wouldn't have made that mistake. And his life was in like the shitter. Or it had to have been um, like a hit because he knew too much and like what people wanted him dead and like knew he was desperate because he was working at a gas station. So what could he sell to who, um, for money? So they thought he was like a flight risk. He was already talking to Israel, you know, about getting out. So they're like, you know, so there are plenty of people who think that this guy was just murdered, but like his, his contributions to the American rocket program and JPL and NASA and everything else are like undeniable. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's like the guy, like the father of it all. It kind of all goes back and starts with him, like a very important person in the 20th century. But nobody knows his name. And I or at least I didn't. I didn't know it and it seems like this is kind of a common thing and there's like a little bit of symbolism where NASA decided, you know, so he died in 52. So well before they had like the lunar lunar landing was in 69. They orbited the moon like multiple times throughout the 60s before they did uh, Apollo 11. And so they're like naming things on the moon. And they're like, we, we should name something after Jack Parsons. So they did. They named this big crater after Jack Parsons on the moon. It's on the dark side. So it's like perfectly symbolic, <laughs> right? Like yeah. we're going to name a crater after him, but uh, we don't want to. If someone says, well, who's that one named after? Him? Ah, we don't want that. So we'll name it, but in a place where no one will ever see it. Yeah. And that's kind of like they kind of brushed him aside in history because they're like he would credit some of his achievements to the cult. Thelema, yeah. the, the, the occult. So it's just like, well, how do you they like we don't want to like be discredited like we're already struggling to get funding. Uh, we don't want to be discredited because our top guy is like this weird sex cult guy. So yeah. we just have to like get rid of him and brush him aside forever. But he is like a legitimate genius. And like, who knows if we ever land on the moon or have rockets like without him. So yeah, wow, it's a fucking that is wild a, that is a, story. A very yeah. interesting story, man. I yeah. did not know about this guy. Yeah. Obviously, I guess two questions. Do mm -hmm. you believe that like hits like this happen? Hundred percent. Yeah. Hundred percent. Like hits like the government takes somebody out. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Everybody is self interested. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of like a recent example that I could point to, but I don't know if I want to be like, I don't Super. really have what. Well, like that being the Epstein example is like the best. Yeah, one. that's like perfect example. Yeah. yeah. And it was funny how that how that worked yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know the rich and powerful, and it's just like well. Yeah. My second thing is it's uh, like going back to the very beginning of this podcast. Like people are so intelligent into one thing. Hyper focused. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wish I was like that. Yeah. I but channel all my at brain the same into time, one thing. like society doesn't cater to that, at least early on in your adolescence. Yeah. You know? Kind of like, do the opposite. Yeah, yeah. Like they want like. Yeah. You always get told you should be well rounded. You should be well. Yeah. Well, you yeah. Know, no, you know, like that yeah. dude, like 
was getting fucking the Pythagorean theorem jammed into his head when he's like, no, dude, I got to fucking. I got rock. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. He's like, nah, like I don't have time for, for, you know, English Huck Finn and things like that. Yeah. Like I gotta, like, what do you do? You know, with a kid you, like that? Yes. Like, I don't know. You know, yeah. you're just looking at this kid and this kid's like, man, this kid's so in the dirt. He like, yeah. Wants to know the, <laughs> the greatest farmer who ever lived. <laughs> exactly. I, part of me thinks that you should try to like cultivate that and like give yeah, him everything. I just don't know if it's he, possible. Though. Yeah. I don't know either. I don't even, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But it's like, interesting that, though. Yeah. When you said, like, did the government perform hits, though, like that quote from The Godfather popped in my head. You know what I'm talking about? No, uh, not. He's, so you got Corleone. I think it's at the end of Godfather 1, but he's talking to Kay, his, his wife. Mm-hmm. And she, they're talking about his dad. And he's like, he's a powerful government person, just like, you know, powerful person, just like, you know, anybody else. And, she, and like presidents and senators. And she's like, presidents and senators don't have people killed. And he goes, okay, who's being naive now? <laughs> and, and it's and it's like, I think that's probably true, you know. Like, and it's just things that we'll never really know about. Like, and I and I also think it's like industry things. I'm sure there's been like dozens of theories about different pharmaceutical people who get whacked out. And we had the we had the episode a long time ago about the guy who made the car who can run on water that he you know mysteriously died. And it's like you know a lot of single car accidents, a lot of suicides. I saw a tweet the other the other day, it might've been yesterday, where in the last 18 months, this is Russia, but in the last 18 months or so, or maybe it was just this year, there's been 12 Russian oligarchs who have either jumped from windows or, or uh, were involved in single car accidents mysteriously. Oh, really? Yeah, so I think it's something that has probably been going on forever. And like we'll shine a light on it when it's happening in other places like Russia, but when it's happening here, it's like all the headlines are, no, no, oh, no. what a what a terrible tragedy yeah. that that guy, you know, jumped from his window or fell out or whatever. But I think it's it's definitely something that happens. It's prevalent, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, interesting story. What'd you Fascinating. think? Good. I mean, good. This is yeah, great back to back. To be honest, yeah. With last week, is so the listener suggestions? Fucking, yeah. You guys but, are and great. Like, that is the that is like the overarching point. Like, I got probably six, six or seven good ones from shouting out that guy Ben who gave yeah. us uh, USS Indianapolis. This one I thought was just awesome, and it's like I can't. I got a I got a terrible memory, but it's like we can't know everything or know every story, anyways. Like, so crowdsource it. So yep. that was great. So thank you. Uh, I wish I. There's just too many DMs. I couldn't find it, but you know who you are. So thank you. You know who you are. Thank yep. you too. Um, All right, everybody, that's it for today. We will be back tomorrow. We will see you then.